December 19, 2005. Chalks Ocean Airways Flight 101, a 58-year-old Grumman G73 Turbine Mallard seaplane with 20 people on board, is taking off from the Miami seaplane base, bound for a short 25-minute flight to Bimini in the Bahamas. The seaplane accelerates across the water and becomes airborne, but less than a minute after taking to the sky, something goes wrong. Eyewitnesses on the beach report seeing the plane's right wing come apart from the plane and catch fire. The plane impacts the water, killing all on board. What happened to Chalks Ocean Airways 101? Why did the wings separate from the fuselage? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris, and we're back. Hello, Chris. Hi. Seaplanes. It's a seaplane. We, have we, I don't think we've done no. a seaplane before, have we? No, no, I would remember. I like seaplanes. I think they're cool. Yeah, it's uh, they're pretty cool. I, I learned a bit about seaplanes and the way that they work uh, in looking into this episode. Really interesting. Very different, obviously, than, uh, mm-hmm. than land-based planes. Before we get into it, of course, I want to remind everyone to give us a follow on social media. Uh, we post supplemental images, uh, maybe links to stuff that we talk about. Highly recommend it. It's a great way to to, to take a look. You can, I'll, I'll post photos of this seaplane, this, uh, this older Ooh. plane, this uh, Grumman Mallard. They're really cool. I think they're really cool. I think it's yeah. awesome. Like, a, like, it's like a, it's almost like a transformer. It's like, is it a boat or is it a plane? <laughs> yes, it's both. <laughs> uh, yeah. And anyway, anyway, give us a follow, please. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Black Box Down Pod. And uh, we have um, our premium uh, version of the show with yeah. Noah Hadson. You get it early, uh, early, and yeah. you get bonus content. And uh, yeah. you can do that at uh, what blackboxdownpod.com. Dot com. That's it. Yeah, so, uh, two ninety nine a month. Uh, what a deal! And it supports us. It su- directly supports us. And I think if you're on, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, I believe there's an option for a free trial. And there may be in the other platforms as well. I think you can get like a seven day free trial. And there's like a bonus if you sign up for a year. Oh, one other like quick side note. You know, we we come, we're coming back off our break here, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we 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 did our round of episodes. We did some supplemental content. We're back in like our core episodes. Over our break, I finally actually got my private pilot license. So I, I feel I, 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 I can now say I am a pilot, but <laughs> only for like small single engine land planes, <laughs> no, <laughs> no seaplanes and nothing uh, with multiple engines. Everyone so. tell Gus, congratulations. Uh, I, know, no, or, I know you can't hear them on the podcast, but you can do it on social media. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Anyway, so Chalks Ocean Airways Flight 101 was an international passenger flight. Again, like we said, going from Miami Beach, Florida to Bimini in the Bahamas back on December 19th, 2005. The flight was crewed by Captain Michelle Marks, who was 37 years old with 2,820 flight hours, and First Officer Paul DeSanctis, who was 34 years old with 1,420 flight hours. And this was an older aircraft. It was a 58-year-old Grumman G73T turbine Mallard with 31,226 hours and 39,743 cycles. The Mallard, just to kind of try to put it in your mind's eye, it's a high-wing plane, so you know, the wings aren't low on the fuselage. They're high. Obviously, if it's a seaplane, like the, w- the mm. wings need to be a little higher yeah. to avoid hitting the water. Uh, and it's got two big propellers, uh, one on each wing. And, you know, it was an amphibious aircraft. So even though it's a seaplane, it also had landing gear. So it could take off oh, and land on land anything. as well. The landing, gear, the landing gear is actually really cool. It retracts up into the body if it's going to land on the water. You know, just like yeah. normally, you know, a plane, the landing gear retracts anyway. This one, they don't have to put it down if they're landing on water. But if they want to land on a normal runway on the land, they can put the landing gear down. Yeah, a really sweet vehicle for zombies. Yeah, it would, it would be. I think that, you know, they could even, I don't remember exactly how it works. I want to say that they could land on the water, kind of like use their power, get over close to the land, then get like close to a ramp, put oh. their gear down, and then like drive up out of the water onto the land. Oh, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, like, like amphibious aircraft. You know, it was, it was really, it's a really versatile aircraft. Yeah. And then attached also on the end of each wing is like a little pontoon that stops the wing from touching the water and it helps the plane float when it's taxiing on the water. That's super cool. Yeah, it's it's super cool. And there were 18 passengers on board this aircraft as well as two pilots. That's about as many people as this plane could hold. It's not very big. Mm -hmm. So this was pretty much full with 20 people on it. And on the day of the accident, this crew had flown the plane from Fort Lauderdale to the Miami seaplane base and landed about 1.21 p.m. I had to look this up. So <laughs> like the seaplane base is like east of Miami airport off the, like right along the coast of Florida. It's, it's like a kind of like a shipping channel. There's a bunch of boats in the area, you know, a bunch of cargo comes through and they have like a seaplane base where seaplanes huh. can take off and land. 
it's neat. I, I had no idea such things existed. So uh, that's one of the things I looked into and learned when you know, looking into this incident. Anyway, they landed at Miami Seaplane Base at 1.21 p.m. Then they took off at 2.38 p.m. from the water runway. And this was a VFR flight, so visual flight rule. So probably not having to talk to any air traffic control at the time. Hmm. About one minute after takeoff, the plane crashed into the water and the airplane was destroyed by impact forces and everyone on board was killed. Most of the wreckage was located about 30 feet below, you know, at the bottom, uh, underwater, in a shipping channel near the port of Miami. Lifeguards who were patrolling Miami Beach on foot and on jet skis were the first to respond to the accident site. And uh, Miami Emergency Dispatch notified the Coast Guard. And about seven minutes after being notified, the Coast Guard sent a helicopter to the scene. There's actually, so this, like we said, this is December 2005. There's some very grainy, low-quality cell phone video of this. Oh. Yeah, obviously, the people on the beach you know, were witnessed it. And I think like someone on the beach was filming a friend of theirs doing something. And, you know, they saw the the plane crashing and they turned it around. They turned their camera around in time to to get a little, the last little bit, the last few seconds of uh, video as the plane was impacting uh, the ocean. And in the video, well, I'll see, I'll see if I find a link to the video and put it in okay. our social media. In the video, you can, despite the fact it's low quality and grainy mm-hmm. and everything, you can see the wing has separated from the plane and the wing is on fire. So it didn't even get in the air before it separated. No, they were in the air. Okay. They were in the air. And that's when like the the camera whips around. It's it's falling out of the air. Mm. And you know, you can see the wing clearly separate from the rest of the the rest of the plane. So of course this is in the United States. So the investigation's done by the NTSB. And they had about 15 witness reports, and most of them reported the airplane's right wing separated from the airplane in flight. And that smoke or fire came from the wing as the airplane descended into the water. And we've talked about this before lots of times. Eyewitness accounts, super unreliable. But when you have 15 of them and they're all saying the same Uh thing, probably reliable in that case. You know, if you're talking to one person and they say something, you kind of take it with a grain of salt. But when you're independently interviewing this many people and they're all reporting the same thing, they're probably right. Of those witnesses, about half of them reported they heard an explosion associated with the wing separation. Most of the main wreckage was scattered within a debris field of about 200 by 200 feet. The fuselage, left wing, left engine, landing gear, and the empennage, which is like the tail, uh, were Mm -hmm. located within the main debris field. And all of this was submerged in the water along a rock jetty. The separated right wing with the right engine attached was located about 160 feet northwest of the main debris field. And the center wing box structures were fractured where the wing intersected the fuselage, allowing the right wing to separate. Examination of the wreckage found that the right wing fuel tank was breached and that fire damage was evident on the right wing. Mm. So kind of going along with yeah. you know, what the people said. Fire damage and soot were also present on fuselage skins and empennage skins after the right wing. And the left wing showed no evidence of fire damage. So obviously it seems pretty clear cut. Yeah, The wing came off, there was a fire. But now, of course, the question is why? You know, why did this uh, wing come off? What happened to cause this to happen? Especially when half of the uh, the witnesses are reporting that they heard an explosion. You know, then you got to start wondering, was there a bomb? Are these people right? Are the people who didn't hear anything, are they the ones who are right? Again, like now that unreliable witness thing starts to, to take hold here. Yeah. So the NTSB found the cockpit voice recorder and it did not sustain any heat or structural damage. But, you know, the recorder was wet, obviously, because it was in the water. And the tape was removed from the recorder and cleaned and the audio information was extracted without difficulty. So, all sounds good. However, the audio was unintelligible. What? The NTSB noted specifically that the characteristics of the audio were similar to that of the tape having been recorded over multiple times without being erased between the recordings. Oh. Like, so, it was just repeat. <sighs> yeah, they were just, instead of erasing the tape and, you know, recording new, it was just recording layer after layer after layer again and again, all over on top of it. So it was like multiple layers of audio all on top of each oh, other. Oh, like, And how many, I, I guess, hundreds? They like, couldn't tell. I mean, <laughs> after a certain point, there's no way to tell. It's just all noise, right? Yeah. Is this because they weren't using it correctly or is it def- defective in some way? Or were they just like, they didn't realize you had to erase it before you put it back? Or Well, th- it should have done that automatically. Mm. Like when it came time, it should automatically, you know, re- erase and start recording over the beginning again. So they test the cockpit voice recorder and they reveal a failure of the electronic circuit card for the erase head. So mm. the, the circuitry that controls the erase head was broken. And the evaluation report indicated that this condition was most likely the reason for the failure of the erase head function. And that on the basis of NTSB's finding of multiple overridings, this failure most likely occurred sometime before the accident. So 
basically like the little electronic controller for that eraser head failed and it happened sometime before the accident. There's no way to know. And the evaluation report further indicated that the cockpit voice recorder pushed to test operation would not likely identify a failure of the erase head because the recorded test tone amplitude would be detected despite the presence of previously recorded audio. So it didn't fully explain that. What I took away from that is mm. that when there's like when they do the push to test on the cockpit voice recorder, it tests and it tells them if it's working or not. Mm. It seems to me based on the way they described it that the cockpit voice recorder basically records some kind of tone and then listens to see if that tone was on the tape. Mm. And that way it knows, oh, it's working. And that kind of test wouldn't test the erase head. Yeah, and it would be like, oh, it is recording on top of everything right. else. Yeah, e- Even if it was recording that tone on top of other audio, it would still hear the tone and think, oh, yeah, it's working fine. Mm. So it's just like one of those weird like logic loopholes you wouldn't think about. Yeah. You would think like, oh, it's recording. It's got to be working fine. You don't think, oh, well, we also need a test to make sure it's erasing. Even though it was broken, there's no way that anyone would have known unless they had actually pulled the tape and listened to it. Yeah. And unfortunately, this airplane was not equipped with a flight data recorder because one of the FAA regulations excluded 10 to 19 seat turbine powered airplanes to have one if they were brought into the U.S. on or before October 11th, 1991. So this was a smaller, older plane. So it was Mm. exempted from needing a flight data recorder. So I know one of the, you know, I I said some of the, the witnesses said that they heard an explosion and this airline, actually this Chox Ocean Airways, was mm-hmm. actually kind of well known. Like their planes and their airline was well known for running these routes out of South Florida. Uh, I think some of their planes were used like in Miami Vice back in the 80s. Like, oh. I don't know, it's, <laughs> it's just like, uh, it's, it's cool, right? It's, it's a yeah. very cool visual, these seaplanes. And uh, it's very, it was very well known down there. You know, rich people would take this flight uh, to go down to the Bahamas if they didn't want to, you know, if they didn't have a private jet. Uh, in fact, one of the passengers was a, a wealthy couple who were going down to the Bahamas because they were picking up their yacht. You know, it's oh. like those kinds of passengers, which is why I think they want to, you know, maybe they were kind of listening maybe to some of these bomb theories, thinking maybe somebody was targeted on board. But as a real quick spoiler, it was not a bomb. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's just, well, that's just one of the reasons. It was a bomb. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the reasons I mention it. Just, I just want to give like a little more background to it. Chalks Ocean has been around for a long time. I think that the airline itself was founded like in 1917. And like during Prohibition, they we, you know, would run illegal alcohol between the, you know, the Caribbean <laughs> and the United States, like that kind of thing. It's like an airline that had been around for a long time, had like this, this, this air about it, you know, it was like very prestigious within certain circles and had like this mythos about it, you know, as far as like the uh, bootlegging aspect. So the NTSB examined the right wing Uh, And their examination revealed pre-existing fatigue fractures and cracks in the rear Z-stringer, lower skin, and rear spar, lower spar cap, each of which contributed to reducing the wing structure's ability to carry load. I'll explain what that means in just a second, uh, in like two sentences. The analysis revealed that the airplane's right rear Z-stringer fractured first. The stringers run lengthwise in the wing and sit in the front half of the wing. And they call it a Z-stringer because it makes the shape of a Z in a cross section of the wing. So these are like structural support components within the wing. And they look like a Z and they kind of hold the whole thing together and help carry the weight of the wing. These particular wings, they hold the fuel for the plane in them. And there's, uh, if you, I don't know if you, how much you think about the fact that fuel could be in a plane wing. There's, there's, there's actually a couple of different ways that that can be accomplished. Mm -hmm. In the wing, there might be like a bladder that holds all of the wing. You think about it like a a balloon and you inflate it or you fill it with gas or with fuel and that's where it's held. In this particular aircraft, they call this a wet wing. There is no bladder. The fuel is just inside of the wing. What? Like, so it's like a big tank? The wing is a tank? The wing is the tank. Imagine like if your fuel tank was a wing. Then that's that's exactly what this was. What does it not slush around while like? Yeah, d- but I mean, it would do that in a bladder as mm. well. Okay, it just allows them to. No, if you don't have that bladder, it's less weight, and mm. you can fit more fuel. You think about like trying to fit, you know, this bladder inside the wing. That it's not going to fully, you know, conform to the entire shape of the wing. If you don't have that bladder in there, then you just fill it in the wing. You can you can fit more fuel. What is this plane called? I just want to look a picture of it. A Grumman Mallard. A Grumman. Mallard. That's a cool name for a plane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was eventually replaced by, uh, what was it replaced? I want to say it was replaced by the Goose. Let me look it up. Oh, no. It was uh, it was replaced by the uh, Grumman Albatross. <laughs> 
you find it? Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at it. The planes, the, 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 they're in the wings, you said? Yeah, the fuel is all in the wings. Man, that it's skinny. I'm surprised they fit a lot of fuel. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you you could fit a decent amount uh, of fuel in there. Okay. So, like I said, they, they found cracks in this rear Z-stringer, the skin, and the spar cap, which, like I said, and I said, these Z-stringers kind of contribute to the structural stability of all this. Uh, so when they find these cracks, they know that it reduces the wing structure's ability to carry load. Several features indicated that the right Z-stringer had been fractured for some time, most likely years before the accident. Oh. Fatigue initiated at the slosh hole. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they have slosh holes so that the fuel can move around inside the wing. Like huh. It's not just like a bunch of separate tanks in the wing. It's one big tank, and these slosh holes allow the fuel to move around through the wing. That way, as the fuel level gets lower, they don't have to worry about like switching tanks or anything. It's all like one big tank and okay. the fuel goes through the slosh hole. <laughs> so <laughs> fatigue initiated at the slosh hole in the web of the Z-stringer just outboard of the right wing station 34, which is located between the engine and the fuselage. So really close to the fuselage is where these cracks were. Okay. No anomalies such as material defects, mechanical damage, or corrosion were identified as factors to cause fatigue initiation at the slosh hole. It's likely that fatigue initiated at the slosh hole because the number of load cycles on the stringer exceeded its fatigue life. So, like I said, there's no mechanical damage, no corrosion. It had just exceeded its lifetime. It's, you know... How old was this plane? This plane was 58 years old. Okay. So. Yeah, it was, it was an old plane. Uh, but, you know, like we talk about often, things get replaced, things get updated. Just this particular part was past its life cycle. Yeah, and I mean, this... It seems like this is just like the body of the plane, right? Right, yeah. So it's not something that could be replaced? So the Z-stringer, you could maybe like, you, know, you could disassemble the wing and maybe replace the structural elements in it or replace the entire wing. The problem becomes that this is such an old plane that they don't make parts for it anymore. Mm. In fact, I believe Chalks Ocean Airways owned several of these planes and some of them did not run. They just owned several broken planes that they would like cannibalize oh, for parts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's like, they don't need this plane to run. They just need to maybe pull parts off of it. And that's how they managed to keep these older planes um, in the air. Or sea. Or, or on the sea. After the right rear Z-stringer fractured, the lower skin developed a crack. So like these Z-stringers, this is all inside the wing. Mm -hmm holding it together, then that cracked led to stress. So then the actual skin, so like that crack on the Z-stringer, you would not be able to see from the outside. You'd have yeah. to look in the fuel tank, into the wing to see it. But this developed cracks along the lower skin. And this you would be able to see from the outside. Like if you were under the wing and you'd look up, you'd be like, oh, there's a crack right there. Which if you saw a crack in your plane by the wing, you probably, did no one notice the crack? So it's it's not uncommon. I know that sounds really bad. It's not uncommon to have some skin cracks. The skin is really just like, it's not, it, it doesn't hold as much of the weight. It's not really load bearing, you would say. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you have cracks in the skin, there's actually a common procedure where the way, <laughs> this sounds awful, but the way that normally that they're dealt with is the mechanics will drill a hole at the ends of the crack to stop it from spreading further. Okay. So it's like, if you think about it, a crack is just like all that force coming to a single point. If you like take a drill and just drill a small hole at the end of it, it distributes that force across the entire circumference of that hole uh -huh. instead of just being on a single yeah, point. Yeah, no, I get that. So it that, stops it from running. That's just fixing like an aesthetic crack, right? But not. Yeah. The problem is this was more than just an aesthetic skin crack. Right. But from the outside, they don't know that. Looking at it from the outside, they think, oh, it's just cracking a little bit and the, you know, drill a couple holes in it to try Just to stop put a it. hole in the plane <laughs> or, or or you could also there were other things that you could do and uh -huh. other things i'll talk about here in a second some of the things they did about these cracks there is something else they can do as well and i'll talk about that in just a second mallard's got it's got cracks in its slosh <laughs> hole it needs to be it's get skins cracking but remember they couldn't see the cracks in the slosh in the slosh <laughs> hole that's the part of the problem so this skin crack was about 16 inches in length and it consisted of two segments that started from two areas uh, both segments of the skin crack propagated forward and after that initiation site, and the aft segment of the crack initiated from an area of corrosion and missing skin material around the fuel sump drain near right wing station 34. Fuel sump drains are just like little drains at the bottom of the wing where you can sump out a little bit of fuel to look at it and test it. You make sure there's no contamination, no mm -hmm. debris. So it was right around in that area. The forward segment of the skin crack initiated from the rear Z-stringer fastener hole 
which is the first fastener hole outboard of the fracture. Several features observed on this crack and on maintenance reports associated with this crack suggest that the crack also likely developed over a period of months to years. After the lower skin fractured, fatigue cracks initiated in the rear spar lower spar cap. The initiation of these fatigue cracks was likely late in the overall sequence of events because the fracture features indicated relatively rapid growth under relatively high stress. The NTSB's residual strength and fatigue analysis on the right wing structure revealed that the fatigue cracks grew to their critical crack length and that the remaining wing structure could no longer sustain the applied loads. The NTSB concludes that the right wing separated from the accident airplane at wing station 34 because of the pre-existing fatigue fractures and cracks in the rear Z-stringer, lower skin, and rear spar lower spar cap, and that this multiple element fatigue damage reduced the residual strength capability of the wing structure and caused the fatigue failure of the wing during normal flight operations. So eventually all these cracks started converging, becoming too much, and the wing just couldn't hold anymore. It was snapped off. Yeah, a combination of the internal cracks and the external cracks. So I mentioned that they could drill holes at the end of the Uh cracks in order to try to stop them from spreading. There's another thing they could do where they could put what's called uh, a doubler. They could put like another piece of metal over that crack to try to kind of hold it together. Uh It's it's almost like stapling two pieces of paper together. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I'm I'm visualizing just like a a metal thing you like drill each in so that it doesn't separate right right yeah it just kind of holds it together and that's one of the other things they did so uh so you know they would in theory drill the ends of the cracks that way it would stop spreading and then put a doubler over it and you know drill that on and attach it so that it kind of holds everything together and this these cracks the the outer cracks are they just aesthetic or do they like oh could we're they gonna have oh we're gonna get into that <laughs> <laughs> well spoiler uh no it was more than aesthetic uh <laughs> Sunglass season is in full swing. There's no better option than our friends over at Shady Rays. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've ever worn. They've got durable frames with extremely clear polarized lenses for outdoor activities, and that's not all. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection of all eyewear. Every pair is backed by lost and broken replacements, so if you lose or break your pair even on day one, they told us they'll send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. You can wear your Shady Race with confidence because they have your back long after you purchase. They also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order. They've donated over 20 million meals to date. Look good in your shades and feel good by making an impact. If you don't love them, exchange them for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop with Shady Rays. Their team always has your back. Exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com, use code BLACKBOXDOWN for 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 200,000 people. Again, that's ShadyRays.com, code BLACKBOXDOWN. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when you go shopping on your iPhone or computer. Uh, I think we all know, we all, we're all probably very familiar with uh, online shopping. Uh, I know I do it all the time. I try to shop online as much as possible, whenever possible. Uh, and I know we've all been there. You see that promo code uh, field when you're checking out and you're wondering, what could you put in there to save a little bit of extra money? Well, thanks to Honey, sh- manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites when you check out. The Honey button appears. All you have to do is click Apply Coupons. You just wait a couple seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. And if Honey finds a working coupon, I mean, it's like magic. You watch the prices drop. Not that long ago, I was buying some uh, blue jeans online. And uh, when I went to check out, uh, Honey button appeared, clicked it, automatically saved money instantly. Uh, it's it's really that easy. Uh, sometimes I forget that it's there and the little uh, Apply Coupons button pops up. You're like, oh, yeah, free money it's going right back into my wallet. Super easy to use. And uh, Honey doesn't just work on desktop. It also works on iPhone, too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone. Save when you're on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. Uh, By getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. I'd never recommend something I don't use, so get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash blackboxdown. I know we've all been there. Whenever a brand new shiny piece of technology comes out, uh, you're always a little scared to look at the price of it. We all get sticker shock when we see uh, what cutting edge gadgets can actually cost us and if you've ever shopped for electric bikes you probably need to sit down when you saw those price tags but electric e-bikes cost way less than other e-bikes without skimping on quality or features 
Price is not the only reason electric e-bikes are for everyone. They fold in half for easy storage. They come fully assembled with free shipping. Plus, customize your e-bike with seat padding, size, and suspension options to maximize comfort. Uh, it's really great, uh, honestly, the way that they ship it. It is uh, fully put together. You don't need any tools. You get it. You open up the box, and you just unfold the bike, and boom, you're ready to go. Uh, super comfortable, super easy to, to use. I mean, you get going almost immediately. I find myself trying to use it whenever possible and ditching the car. Uh, just getting outside, getting a little bit of fresh air. Uh, it's, it's really nice. And plus, if you're really lazy like me, you can use, use the uh, electric function all the time, and you don't actually even have to pedal. Uh, electric e-bikes mission is simple make everyday e-biking adventures accessible to the masses they're surprisingly affordable the best bang for your buck in the e-bike industry uh, you can make it your own electric e-bikes are customizable and adjustable to fit your lifestyle they got fantastic features and quality at an unbeatable price and they're very durable with a convenient design like i said they're foldable they ship for free fully assembled you'll be on the road in no time they've got a powerful removable battery bright lcd display seven speed gearing five levels of pedal assist to power your ride They've got 200,000 dedicated riders on the road so far. You could be 200,001. Uh, you can take on any terrain, gravel, snow, sand, more. Cover up to 45 miles on a single charge. Reach up to 28 miles per hour with the help of a powerful 500-watt motor. Way more eco-friendly transportation option. Explore the great outdoors or the city without the carbon footprint of a car. They give you optimal comfort, convenience, and safety. So hop on, ride with electric e-bikes. Go to electricebikes.com. Get $100 off any e-bike purchase that's L E C T R I C ebikes.com. So, the Chalks Ocean Airways maintenance program was ineffective in identifying and correcting the long standing structural problems that led to the in flight separation of the accident airplane's right wing near Wing Station 34. Uh, because several of these problems occurred over months and years. Like I said, this was something that built slowly over time. Mm -hmm. Company maintenance and inspection personnel had multiple opportunities to identify and correct the individual damage components, and thus they could have prevented the wing failure. Although maintenance personnel detected some problems and attempted repairs, many of the repairs were ineffective in that they did not properly restore the load-carrying capability of the wing structure. Ineffective repairs observed on the accident airplane included documented repairs performed by company maintenance personnel and some undocumented repairs. Also, company inspection personnel failed to identify that the repairs were ineffective. The ineffective repairs observed on the accident airplane include the following. All right, so we're going to go ahead and list all the things that they did. You know, I, I said... I kind of mentioned some of the things that they could do to stop this, and here are the things that they actually did. Sanding marks were observed around the rear Z-stringer slosh hole and fracture lips at right wing station 34, suggesting that the sanding was an attempt to remove cracking that had been detected on, in the Z-stringer. The cracking, however, was not completely removed, and the crack continued to propagate over time. So again, if they see these cracks, they could try mm -hmm. to sand them down to make them all even, and again, there is no single point of pressure. It stops them from spreading. One of the three internal doublers at, and the doublers are those like mm -hmm. pieces of metal. The, the, yeah, the put metal over to, yeah. bond things. Right. Uh, one of the three internal doublers at right wing station 34 had a portion that covered the lower flange of the rear Z-stringer, suggesting that the portion of the doubler covering the Z-stringer was an attempt to reinforce the fractured Z-stringer. Doubling only the lower flange did not restore the strength of the fractured Z-stringer. So they tried to put a doubler there, but that's not how you would fix that. That doesn't, that, that doesn't, do anything but wait you said of of the z-stringer yeah so this is they did that's the internal that's thing. on the inside yes so and they even, knew that that was a problem they had seen some cracking there then that's the first thing i mentioned was they had sanded that inside part of the z-stringer and they tried putting a doubler in there okay sorry i thought we were talking about the skin cracks mm -mm. no no this is on the inside multiple site fatigue damage at the inboard fastener row for the doublers at the right wing station 34 lined up in the area of the rear Z-stringer before the wings separated, indicating that repairs in this area did not restore the strength of the rear Z-stringer. Several fasteners in the inboard row of fasteners for the doubler repair at right wing structure 34 were inserted through sealant near the fuel sump drain instead of the lower skin. This resulted in ineffective load transfer between the skin and doublers in that area. So I, this is an, another important thing I mentioned here. Uh, they had this sealant in there and they were putting doublers on it. One of the other problems that had happened because of this uh, and the reason i mentioned you know the wet wing earlier was uh, this this particular aircraft also suffered from fuel leaks and one of the things that they would do to try to fix these fuel leaks is you know they would you know, drain the fuel out of the plane you know look inside the wing and the maintenance people would apply sealant to the cracks the, the, like i said there's cracks in the skin there's no bladder in this wing so, so the fuel was seeping out of these cracks in the skin so Inside the wing, they were applying sealant to these cracks to oh try to God. stop it from spreading. And the problem is, 
this sealant was obstructing the actual problem as well. So they were putting sealant oh. on there. And it's like the whole problem and the, some of the cracks in the Z-stringer were not visible because the sealant was kind of, you know, just applied everywhere in there to try to stop the fuel leak. And the fuel leak was happening because of the crack in the Z-stringer. Uh, it's time to retire this plane is what it sounds like. Yeah, it, was, it, it, yeah, it needed serious work. Uh, and there was, uh, lastly, they did do something else. Three stop drill holes. These are the drill holes like uh -huh. I mentioned before. Three stop drill holes were located in the areas of the doubler repair to the lower skin at right wing station 34. The stop drill holes showed that the skin crack was detected at least three times before the doublers were applied. And the crack had extended twice from the location of a previous uh, stop drill hole. So they had put these drill holes in to stop the crack and the crack kept going. Oh, Continued crack growth from a stop drill hole is indicative of an underlying structural problem that was not properly addressed in previous mm. maintenance actions. So they should have known when they were drilling these stop drill holes and the crack kept going, hey, something Something's else is wrong. wrong. Right. There's yeah. something bigger going on here because the prescribed fix for this is not working. And when this doesn't work, that means there's a structural problem. It's not. That's when it's not just an aesthetic. Right. Yeah. So like I said, this, this happened over months, if not years. So this was just continuing to try to apply band-aid on top of band-aid on top of band-aid instead of like taking the band-aid off and be like what's what is actually going on under there let's look at it and actually fix this thing they got a broken arm on this bird right yeah you're not going to fix a broken arm with band-aids and like i said even the flight logs documented these fuel leak discrepancies that i talked about before that had been occurring for months before the accident and many of these discrepancies occurred near the area on the right wing that separated oh from the plane like it, all so the warning obvious. signs were there, yeah, right? It's like, huh, this crack keeps getting worse, and, won't, and man, it's the leak of fuel, and oh, oh my God. Yeah, let's put another Band-Aid on it. The Chalks Ocean Airways Director of Maintenance stated that the fuel leaks reported by pilots were addressed before a flight was released. However, the flight logs showed that the fuel leak discrepancies often took several attempts to resolve, but when they were resolved, they would just recur. And, you know, because, like I said, the wing skin and other wing box structures make up the wing fuel tank... Wing fuel leaks can be indicative of discrepancies with the wing box structure. Like I said, this is indicative of a structural problem, the fact that these leaks keep coming back. Mm -hmm. Other maintenance-related problems existed with the accident airplane. For example, during post-accident metallurgical examinations, corrosion was observed in many locations throughout the airplane structure, with some areas showing significant pitting and thinning. If you remember, this, this is like a, a seaplane. It's out over the ocean all the time. That salt water can mm. you know, start to eat away at parts. Yeah. Also, the metallurgical examination showed significant fatigue cracks on the left wing, including one crack in the left wing front spar lower spar cap that had extended from an area of corrosion damage and had begun to progress fairly rapidly. The crack was located in an area that had not been repaired and did not have adjacent structural element failures. If the accident airplane had not experienced a catastrophic failure at right wing station 34, the crack in the left wing front spar lower spar cap would likely eventually have led to a catastrophic failure. So even if the right wing didn't fail on this flight, the left wing was getting ready to fail too. It's, it's it was, what that boils it down to. Was the same issue exactly or just slightly no. in a different place? Slightly different place, but it was the plane needed to go away. Y yeah, or it needed new wings or it either needed to go away or it needed uh, like some really extensive maintenance. Yeah. So the Chalk Oceans Airways Principal Maintenance Inspector was responsible for overseeing the company's maintenance program plan and the maintenance performed on the airplane in the company's fleet. Uh, the principal maintenance inspector is an FAA representative who is responsible for the approval and surveillance of the maintenance program. During a post-accident interview, the PMI, or the principal maintenance inspector, stated that he was comfortable with the maintenance being conducted on Chalks Ocean Airways airplanes, and he did not convey any concerns about the quality of the maintenance program. The PMI also noted that the company's maintenance program plan met all FAR requirements. It's like the federal aviation regulations. It's like all the code that dictates uh -huh. planes and the... the aviation everything in general this is after the accident they're saying this yes that is correct this is all he, he makes these comments in post-accident interviews mm. the pmi's paperwork however did include some of the major repairs that have been done on the wing of this aircraft because the regulations the pmi follows does not specifically include requirements for inspecting airplane structures that are susceptible to fatigue cracking a thorough aging aircraft inspection alone would not likely detect the multiple element fatigue cracking on the accident airplane's right wing and the significant fatigue crack on the airplane's left wing, front spar, lower spar cap. So regulations, you know, didn't require him to inspect the structure, so he probably wouldn't have seen it. Mm. However, all that being said... All the other stuff. Right. You know, 
All that being said, the NTSB was concerned that the PMI's aging aircraft inspection and records review for Chalks Ocean Airways did not include a repair that was undocumented in the maintenance records but was known to company maintenance personnel. As stated previously, the fuel leak discrepancies on the accident airplane were repeated indicators of wing structural damage issues that the Chalks Ocean Airways maintenance program did not effectively address. Because the PMI had information that the fuel leaks were recurring, and that a designated engineering representative's evaluation of the leaks led to extensive structural repairs of the airplane's wing structure, the PMI should have realized that the skin and sealant repair method being applied to the airplane were not sufficient. Uh, however, no evidence indicated the PMI investigated the cause of the repetitive fuel leaks or discussed these issues with company management. So they kind of gave him a pass on the structural you know, integrity issues, mm-hmm. but point out that these other issues were something that should have been at the very least discussed. Yeah. Or like talked about, you know, all the said and done. It's that you know after we've talked about all this, it's this is all very cut and dry. Old plane, poor maintenance, all the warning signs of a structural problem, and eventually, you know, the wing fails and plane crashes. Yeah. So you know uh, the findings uh, in the report are uh, the fire damage to the fuselage and empennage was a result of the failure of the right wing and the subsequent breach in the wing fuel tank. The accident was not survivable. The emergency response was timely. There was no evidence from the performance or appearance of the airplane that would have provided warning to the flight crew of the right wing's imminent failure. And there was nothing that the crew could have done to regain control of the airplane after the in-flight separation of the right wing. The right wing separated from the accident airplane at wing station 34 because of pre-existing fatigue fractures and cracks in the Z-stringer, lower skin and rear spar lower spar cap. And this multiple element fatigue damage reduced the residual strength capability of the wing structure and caused the fatigue failure of the wing during normal flight operations. The repetitive fuel leaks near the area where the accident airplane's right wing separated from the fuselage were indicators of structural damage inside the right wing. Again, it's like this was all developed over time. Plenty Mm -hmm. of warning signs. Chalks Ocean Airways most likely performed the doubler repair to the accident airplane's lower skin at right wing station 34, and this repair should have been reflected in the company's maintenance records. Again, that's never good when there's maintenance going on that's not properly documented. Mm. The doubler repair to the accident airplane's lower wing skin at right wing station 34 was ineffective because the doublers did not restore the load carrying capability of the skin in the area of the fuel sump drain, and the repair did not properly address the underlying cause of the skin cracking, which was the cracked or fractured rear Z-stringer. On the basis of the repetitive nature of the fuel leaks on the accident airplane and the structural damage that was found during the fuel leak inspection of another company airplane, that led to the August 2005 replacement of that airplane's lower right wing skin and stringers, Chalks Ocean Airways should have performed a comprehensive inspection and maintenance on the wing structures of the airplanes in its fleet. So they had found kind of a similar structural damage and leak in a different plane in August of 2005. And this accident happened in December of 2005. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they found that other issue and had to deal with it, probably should have looked at all of their planes just to be safe, especially this one that had a very similar problem going on. Yeah. So they fi- the other one they fixed fully, like they just repaired it? I don't know exactly what they did. It says that they did a replacement of the airplane's lower right wing skin and stringers. So it sounds like they replaced all of the, the parts that broke in this plane. Oh, man. The failure of Chalks Ocean Airways to identify and properly repair fatigue cracks in the accident airplane's wing structure and the numerous maintenance-related problems found on the accident airplane and another company airplane demonstrate that the company's maintenance program and practices were deficient, and these deficiencies were causal to the accident. The Chalks Ocean Airways maintenance program plan was inadequate to maintain the structural integrity of its aircraft fleet, and you got to have a good plan when you're dealing with planes that are this old. Like, all of their planes mm-hmm. were older like this, you know, pushing 60 years old. That's fine if you're on top of the maintenance, but you need to have a good plan. You need to be well-funded. You need to really be proactive about fixing things to keep these planes airworthy. Yeah. Uh, And the last finding here, the FAA's procedures for maintenance program oversight when applied to commercial operators of aircraft with limited manufacturer or engineering support, such as Chalks Ocean Airways, are insufficient to ensure the adequacy of such programs, structural airworthiness plans, and thus the safety of such aircraft operations and the FAA's failure to identify the inadequacy of the Chalks Ocean Airways maintenance program was causal to the accident. So that kind of, Talk that you know gives a little bit of blame to the FAA for not having a better plan for airlines that operate like this, where this plane is not produced anymore, there's no support for it. How you know what should the rules be for an airline that operates planes like this? You know, they don't like I said, like I said, they don't have manufacturer or engineering support. There's no one who can, you know, make new parts for this plane. Yeah. Well or or do engineering studies. So then 
Yeah, what is the solution for that? They, they got to come up with all new rules for this. <laughs> right? that the rules, the, it's like, oh, we don't have rules for this. We need to come up with rules for this. That's that's the solution. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I uh, To be honest, I don't know what the answer is today. There's probably, uh, if I had to guess, I bet there are uh, boutique businesses that do custom machining and custom engineering and manufacturing mm-hmm. for this kind of stuff. But I'm sure it's incredibly expensive because there's not... Yeah, op- they're not you know they didn't make this originally, and they're not operating at scale. And they probably like kept have that specialist like come out and inspect or something. Right, I, that's that would be speculation. That would be how I would think that they would approach it. I don't know <laughs> uh, for a fact. So the NTSB determines that the probable cause of this accident was the in-flight failure and separation of the right wing during normal flight, which resulted from the failure of Chalk Ocean Airways maintenance program to identify and properly repair fatigue cracks in the right wing and the failure of the FAA to detect and correct deficiencies in the company's maintenance program. So after all, all those findings, they actually only have three recommendations here. Okay. One, verify that the maintenance programs of commercial aircraft operators include stringent criteria to address recurring or systematic discrepancies to include, if necessary, further analysis of the discrepancies through a comprehensive engineering evaluation. So, you know, when problems are recurring, mm-hmm. have maybe an engineering evaluation to figure out why. Yeah. Two, Identify the systemic deficiencies in the maintenance program oversight procedures that led to this accident and modify those procedures to ensure that the maintenance program plans for commercial operators are adequate to ensure the continued airworthiness, both structural and otherwise, of the operator's fleet. So again, this is kind of dealing with maintenance specifically for planes that might not be made anymore. Yeah. So they want to make sure that they're, you know, they're still airworthy and that everything's fine with them. Uh, and then the third one, Require records reviews, aging airplane inspections, and supplemental inspections for all airplanes operated under 14 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 121. That's commercial, like passenger airlines. All U.S. registered airplanes operating under 14 CFR, Part 129. And all airplanes used in scheduled operations under 14 CFR, Part 135. This would include those airplanes operated under 14 CFR, Part 135, that carry nine or fewer passengers, and those that are operated in scheduled cargo service. So... Again, just records reviews and inspections for aging airplanes for basically any plane that carries a passenger or cargo, essentially. Yeah. So uh, 14 CFR Part 129 is for an air carrier. Remember I mentioned the FAR earlier, the Federal Aviation Uh Regulations? That's what this is. 14 CFR, that's just a book. It's just all the regulations. And if you were to open that book and look, Part 121 is like passenger airlines. Uh, Part 129 is foreign airlines. And Part 135 is like on-demand commuter airlines, kind of like private planes. There's so many parts in there, uh, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a thick book. It's, a, it's really interesting, though. It's, like, it's, it's basically like the rule book of airplanes, you know? <laughs> the, the all-encompassing rule book. Yeah. So after the accident, all remaining mallards in Chalk's fleet were grounded. Subsequently, all were discovered to be suffering from severe corrosion, oh. with many showing signs of substandard repair during maintenance. Uh-huh. So good thing they were grounded. Yeah. And that, I wonder if that guy, did that guy who made the statement that who was in charge of their maintenance and repair still hold by his statement after they were all grounded? Uh, I don't know. I don't uh, have any information about that. I, I couldn't say. I, I don't know. I, I really have no idea. I hope he got in some trouble. Then two years later, Chalks Ocean Airways went out of business. Yeah, were they sued? I don't know if they were sued, but they were... Um, their, their flying charter was revoked by the U.S. Department of Transportation. Mm. So they were no longer allowed to, and that's when they went out of, uh, out of business. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they were actually sued by quite a few people. Um, I don't know what the outcome of those uh, suits were, but they, they, were, sh- they were sued. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure not great for <laughs> chalks. Yeah, uh, I think the... Passengers and crew, I think there were uh, a couple of different lawsuits that were filed against them. Uh, and I think that they did eventually reach a settlement in all of them. I don't know you know, what that settlement amount was. But yeah, they did. Uh, I think that the, it was speculated that they were sued. They had to, as part of the settlement, they probably paid about $51 million uh, in lawsuit settlement. Mm. But I don't know that for certain. That seems to be the most common uh, bit of speculation about there it. There were, what, 20 people who died? Yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, you know, they went out of business, um, you know, after this, and they were, they had been around for 90 years when they finally ceased operations. Uh, they had claimed to be the oldest continuously operating airline in the world at the time, but they've been replaced. KLM uh, is mm-hmm. now the oldest operating 
uh, airline in the world. They were founded in 1919. Is that the French one? No, uh, it's uh, Dutch. Dutch. Uh, we have a KLM flight out of Austin. Aust- you fly Austin to Amsterdam on KLM. Oh, that'd be fun. Uh, but that's it. That's Chalks Ocean uh, Airways 101. Like we said earlier, give us a follow on social media at Black Box Down Pod. The, I think the Mallard looks really cool. I'll post it some does. images of it. it uh, I'll, I'll post that uh, video that the person on the beach took. And I'll see if I can find clips of Chalks Ocean Airways in entertainment like i said i read that they they were in some episodes of miami vice i'll see if i can dig those up <laughs> just for fun and put them on here i'm gonna make a quick note to myself to do that and i'm now i'm dreaming of of living on a on a mallard <laughs> what, like my new my zombie apocalypse plan has changed you just go out to like the middle of the ocean and yeah because so i was looking at some of them some of them have like uh like little beds and stuff little like yeah. beds and you'd you know. open up the door and fish yeah, open up the door, you fish, or you goose fly to a lake, you know? Yeah. Uh, you just got to make sure you take care of the wings. Yeah, exactly. So before we wrap up, uh, I don't think you know this yet, Chris. A uh, little little bit of bad news. Uh, this is going to be our last episode with Dennis, uh, our pro- our producer and researcher. Dennis, you know, has helped. Uh, Dennis has written every episode of Black Box. Well, I think all, just about every episode of Black Box Down we've ever done. Uh, does a, a lot of the heavy lifting. We talk about Dennis all the time. I think he's he's been in... A couple of things in the past, not very many. But yeah, uh, I want to thank you for all your work, Dennis. Uh, all the hard work you've you've done, you you will be sorely missed. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be tough leaving, but I I I enjoyed working on the show a, a lot. Yeah, it's uh, I, I can't imagine uh having done this show without you. It's gonna be, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not looking forward to 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 continuing to do it without you. Uh, but uh, yeah, good luck. I I don't know if uh you want to talk about anything that you're gonna be doing or. Or I, whatnot. I mean, I think we it's it's related. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah. Dennis is going to be uh, uh, moving on doing something in the in the aviation field. So I'm actually really excited for him. Really excited to uh, to see how that goes. So thanks for thanks for everything, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Well, thank you all for uh, I don't know for being good hosts. <laughs> <laughs> is there anywhere people like people can follow you if they want to, you know, or anything anything like that on social media? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at at the Dennis Fant. F A N T. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. If you've enjoyed the show, say, tell Dennis thank you. <laughs> yeah. Wish him, wish him well. All right. Uh, that's it for us. Two out of the three of us will be back next week. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, we'll talk to you all then. Bye. 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 Bye.